Hello everyone, and thank you very much for attending this tech talk organized by Alveoli. Today's talk is entitled Digging Deeper into Cellular Mechanisms with Micropatterning and Cryo ET. The presenters are Lia Engel from Stanford University, Matt Einvos and Lea Swistak from Institut Pasteur, and myself from Alveoli. I will first present the Primo technology developed by Alveol and its applications in micropatterning, hydrogel structuration, and microfabrication. Then, Lia and Matain will show you how they use Primo on a daily basis for their electron microscopic experiments. Primo is an optical module plugged at the back of a conventional inverted microscope. Under the control of the Leonardo software, it allows for the projection of UV patterns of any shape and size with a micrometric resolution into the sample placed on the motorized stage of the microscope. On this slide is shown the workflow associated with Primo. The first step consists in designing an image, including images with different gray levels. Once this image is loaded into Leonardo, the parameters of UV projection can be set up and finally UVs are projected from the Primo apparatus through the objective of the microscope according to the images and parameters entered in Leonardo. Now that I have shown you how to project on-demand UV pattern with Primo, I will show you how to use this light in order to take control of the cellular microenvironment. There are three main families of applications. Surface functionalization, also known as micropatterning of biomolecules, hydrogel structuration for 3D cell culture, and microfabrication or the structuration of UV sensitive photoresists. Concerning the first application, the UV light projected by Primo in the presence of a dedicated photoinitiator is able to locally degrade an anti-folding layer of polyethylene glycol. If afterwards a biomolecule solution is incubated, then the biomolecules will specifically adsorb onto the illuminated areas. Two important aspects of this light-induced adsorption of biomolecules is that first it is quantitative, meaning that the Primo system is able to print a biomolecule with an exquisite control over biomolecule densities. And the second aspect is that the micropatterning steps can be repeated in order to print multiple biomolecules with minimal overlapping and optimal alignment. If the biomolecules printed by Primo promotes cell adhesion, then cells will adopt the size and shape of the micropattern as shown on this slide. What I want to highlight here is that Primo is a suitable tool to print any biomolecules, such as cell adhesion molecules, antibodies, streptavidin, etc., onto most of the substrates commonly used in cell biology. Glass slide, plastic petri dishes, soft materials, hydrogens, but also on electron microscopy grids, as it will be detailed later. Such an approach can be used in order to study, for instance, the cell cytoskeleton, the contractility of cardiomyocytes, the migration of cancer cells, or the interaction of different cell types during well-controlled co-culture experiments. The second family of applications I want to discuss today is the hydrogel structuration for 3D cell culture. So I don't have time to get into the mechanisms of UV-induced hydrogel photopolymerization, but the take-home message of this slide is that uh, liquid hydrogel precursors can jellify in response to UV projection with Primo. This allows to generate, for instance, honey cups, 
out of UV sensitive hydrogels into which cells can grow into standardized spheroids, as shown in the upper part of the slide. Non-adhesive structured hydrogels can be further locally functionalized, as shown in the E panel, in order to generate topographically and biochemically controlled environments. Finally, as shown in the bottom right panel, pre-existing non-UV sensitive hydrogels, such as matrigel, can also be structured upon UV illumination by a mechanism called photocision and described in a Pasteurel et al. The last family of application I want to mention is the prototyping of microfabrication experiment. Here is shown the workflow allowing to generate microstructured PDMS chips such as PDMS microfluidics chambers. The main advantage of this approach uh, as compared to classical lithography techniques is the absence of photomasks, offering a lot of flexibility and the fact that the experiment is run directly onto the microscope without the need of a clean room. Here are shown some uh, realizations done with Scribo. On the top panel, you can see the SU8 mother mold of a microfluidic device, and on the right, the final PDMS chip ready to be placed on a glass slide. On the bottom panels are shown microfabricated structures of uh, those responsive UV sensitive photoresist imaged by scanning electron microscopy and generated by Primo. It is now time to listen to Lia Engel and Matt Engos, who will show us how their work in the field of electron microscopy benefits from Primo. But before that, I would like to introduce the biggest challenge in a cryo ET, which is to find a good cell at a good location. And micro patterning is a very promising solution, as it will be explained right after. Micropatterning happens at the early stage of the general cryo ET workflow during the sample preparation phase and does not interfere with the subsequent steps of sample preparation and imaging done on machines commercialized by the main actors of this market, Leica and Thermo Fisher. But I'm sure uh, you will learn much more during the two following talks. So, Leah, the stage is yours. Thanks, Pierre Olivia, for the introduction. I'm excited to walk you through the EM grid micropatterning technology that we developed at Stanford using the Primo photo micropatterning tool. In the two papers below, you can find out more details on the projects I'm going to talk to you about today. And hopefully, these technologies can help you to facilitate better workflows for cellular cryoelectron tomography. So, I'm going to start out by providing the motivation for combining micropatterning with cryoelectron microscopy. So micropatterning of extracellular matrix proteins, or ECM, is an established in vitro cell culture technique used to control cell shape. In this technique, ECM islands of arbitrary geometry are deposited on a cell culture sub substrate. As cells spread across the adhesive islands, they form attachments to the ECM. In the example on the left, Manuel Terry and co-authors show that cell polarity is governed by ECM geometry. The top panel shows an adhesive fibronectin crossbow pattern which creates an anisotropic cell microenvironment. You can see in the second panel that a single cell spread on the micropattern will adapt the shape of a fan. And in the panel below, you can see the distributions of vinculin, actin, and cord actin in fixed stained cells assembled on these micropatterns. The cord actin was restricted to the curved adhesive micropatterned regions, while the actin stress fibers in the central panel are enriched at the suspended non-adhesive edges of the cells. This polarization of the cell cortex due to the shape of the ECM was further propagated to the internal organization of the cell in the positioning of the nucleus, centrosome, and Golgi apparatus. So micropatterning can be used not only to shape cells, but to influence their subcellular organization. On the right, you can see live cell imaging from Sanjay Kumar's lab showing cells spreading on rectangular micropatterns with the actin stress fibers assembling in parallel to the leading edges of the cells. 
His recent publication explored the dynamics of stress fiber network organization during cell spreading, finding that the rate of spreading depends on the micropattern geometry. So micropatterning is increasingly being used to understand how the size and structure of the cell microenvironment regulates cell architecture, mechanics, differentiation, polarity, and function. But what does this modification of the cell microenvironment mean for the mechanical interaction between the cell and the substrate? So with traction force microscopy and ECM micropatterning, we can correlate the cell morphology and the regulation of force transmission. So in the figure on the left, you can see a great example of this. There are single cells assembled on micro patterns of the same area, but different aspect ratio. From the traction maps in the panel below, you can see that in areas of higher local curvature, you have higher traction stresses. The adjacent graph shows that the strain energy of single cells spread on micro patterns of different areas scales with the cell size independent of the number of cell ECM adhesions. On the right is a paper from Beth Pruitt's lab, which looked at cell-cell forces in cell doublets assembled on rectangular ECM micropatterns. The ECM micropattern can be seen in the schematic in green. Cell-cell forces inferred from the traction maps um, show that as the aspect ratio of these rectangular ECM micropatterns was increased from 1 to 1.7, so as the cell pairs were essentially stretched, the cell-cell forces, forces across the junctions increased. However, it was unclear how these increased forces were being sustained by the cell. In other words, while we can use ECM micropatterning to regulate the strain energy and distribution of traction stresses in, in cells, we know comparatively little about the nanometer scale organization of the mechanosensitive macromolecules and cellular components that underlie the cell's ability to generate and sense mechanical force. For that, we would need a tool that can visualize cellular organization at the nanoscale. Enter cryoelectron tomography, or cryoET. Um, and so this is the highest resolution tool available for structural analysis of macromolecular organization in cells. And so by micropatterning EM grids, uh, these are the substrates that cells are grown on for cryoET, we reason that we could answer important questions about nanometer scale organization in cells under morphological modulation. And that really provided the motivation for this work. So to perform cryoET on cells, you grow the cells on EM grids, you vitrify the samples. Uh, because in this technique, electrons need to pass through the sample, the total thickness has to be below about 500 nanometers. So sometimes thinning the sample by cryofib is required. Um, following that, electron microscopy is performed at a series of tilt angles, creating a series of projections from which a 3D view of the sample, or a tomogram, is reconstructed. So now let's talk about EM grids. We and other researchers use EM grids that are comprised of a thin metal mesh, about three millimeters in diameter, overlaid with a perforated thin film, usually carbon or silicon dioxide. For adherent mammalian cells, we use gold grids, which are less cytotoxic than copper. So micropatterning of EM grids was actually first performed by T et al. using microcontact printing. So here you can see a cell assembled on a circular ECM micropattern. They use correlative light and electron microscopy on these substrates to show that uh, cellular chirality arises from self-organization of the active cytoskeleton. And at the far right, you can see a tomogram showing radial and transverse axon fibers at the cell edge. So microcontact printing requires contact between a stamp loaded with sticky protein and the substrate. In our hands and on standard quantifiable EM grids, this is a destructive technique. So due to the fragile nature of the EM grids, we were in the market for a micropatterning technique that would maintain the grid structural integrity. Lucky for us, we had access to a Primo system. So on this slide, you can see our Primo setup uh, at Stanford and in Beth Pruitt's lab at UC Santa Barbara. And now we'll go through in detail how we developed this technology to micropattern EM grids with Primo. So in A, you can see the ECM micropattern in green deposited on the holy carbon film of an EM grid and aligned to the grid in such a way that the shapes are centered between the metal grid bars. In B, you can see a cross-section showing the silicon stencil that we use to immobilize the grid on the glass slide for rinsing and patterning steps. Because when I began this study, I was new at handling grids, and it was a very convenient way of minimizing handling. And a photo of that can be seen in C. So we start out by plasma treating the grid to render the surface hydrophilic. 
We then add polyalacine graph polyethylene glycol for an hour to electrostatically absorb the PLL G tag to the surface via, via the positively charged PLL backbone. We then add the PLPP photoinitiator, load the sample onto the stage of the scope outfitted with Primo, load image files into the Leonardo software, expose the grids, rinse the grids, add our ECM protein of choice, seen here in green, incubate for an hour, rinse again, and seed the cells, which then assemble on the micro pattern. So with this, with this approach, we were able to achieve large area micro patterns of arbitrary geometry. In the image on the left, you can see GSP gelatin micro, pattern, micro patterns positioned on intact carbon film, uh, so really minimal damage. At right, you can see a rhodamine tag fibronectin square micro pattern in red overlaid with a bright field image of the grid it was deposited on, showing that it is nicely centered between the gold grid bars. And in our first paper, we also showed that maskless photo pattern grids are viable cell culture substrates that promote cell growth and can confine cell spreading to within the boundary of an ECM micro pattern. So the figure on the right over here shows epithelial cells grown on and confined to square and circular fibronectin micro patterns of different sizes. And this was an exciting result for reasons beyond the mechan mechanobiology that motivated our study. Julia Muhammad's lab, in collaboration with Manuel Carri's lab, applied, uh, applied EM grid micropatterning to improve the cryo-focused ion beam milling pipeline. Um, so that's cryofib. So in the top panel, they compared cells plated on EM grids that were blanket coated with ECM to EM grids with ECM micropatterns at right. And what you can see is that without the micropatterns, only a small fraction of cells are optimally positioned for cryofib, that means centered on the grid squares, as opposed to the case in the top right where there's a higher yield of optimally positioned cells. In the lower panel, the researchers performed cryofib milling to thin a cell adhered to a micro pattern on an EM grid, and the yellow rectangles indicate the patterns for milling. So F shows the thin lamella produced from the cell, and G shows the tomographic slice of the nuclear periphery of the cell, which can only be accessed using, using FIB. So how is such alignment achieved? Um, as I mentioned a few slides ago, the Leonardo software allows you to uh, load your digital pattern and you can actually observe a projection of the grid in real time. So when I was developing the process, I would actually manually rotate the grid um, to fix its orientation before creating an array of my digital pattern. But more recently, Alveoli has come out with this new software that will de automatically detect the orientation of your grid and um, perform the alignment. And you can actually uh, use the same pattern on the whole surface of the grid or use a series of different patterns like you're looking at now um, on a single chem grid. And the software will actually allow you to adapt the micro pattern size to fit within the mesh. So I'll, I'll usually use a 200 mesh size, um, but this is really a flexible and user-friendly tool So in the next project I'm going to talk about, we sought to study endothelial cell-cell junctions with cryo-EP. So at first, I designed micropatterned islands that could accommodate two cells. But the problem is that the thick nuclei kept positioning themselves up against the cell-cell contact, which you can see in yellow and indicated by the white arrows. So endothelial cells are actually thin enough to be imaged without thinning techniques, but their nuclei are several microns thick. So this is really a problem. We devise a strategy that you can see in the schematic at the top right to micro pattern an ECM lattice. And the intersection points between the ECM tracks on the micro patterns actually attracted the thick cell bodies, promoting the availability of thin cell protrusions for imaging. So when we compared the number of cell cell contacts on imageable region, regions of EM grids that were blanket coated with ECM uh, to grids that were uh, micro patterned with the lattice micro pattern, we found that the bow tie shaped micro patterns significantly increase the number of cell cell junctions occupying grid squares. So each color here uh, in the graph represents a different grid and the gray line indica indicates the median. Not only that, but as I mentioned previously, it's not enough for the cell cell contact to be in an imageable location. They must be thin enough to be imaged by cryo -ET. So we showed in our preprint that lattice micro patterning actually increases the distance between the thick nuclei and the intercellular junctions to improve the likelihood of a well-positioned cell-cell contact falling below the 500 nanometer thickness threshold for direct imaging. So what we also saw when we performed uh, cryo-electron tomography is that 
using this lattice micropatterning technique, we can actually change the orientation of the cells on the grid square. So if you look at A over here, you can tell that the bottom three rows have cells that are oriented vertically, whereas the top rows have cells that are oriented horizontally. So that, that's potentially a way for users to program visual cues for correlative light electron microscopy or even to just locate the grid center. Um, in, in our hands, lattice micropatterning led to such a dramatic increase in the ease of data acquisition that once we'd established optimal cell seeding density and freezing parameters, we didn't need to screen our vitrified grids prior to imaging, uh, as is typically required. Uh, we, we, we always had a sufficient number of cellular subregions that were suitable for imaging. Um, and this technique facilitated our observation of a, of a diversity of filamentous actin-rich membrane protrusions at the endothelial cell cell contacts by cryoelectron tomography. And I'm going to show you uh, several of our reconstructed tomograms right now. So here we're looking at a tomogram of a membrane protrusion with, with an actin bumble, uh, bundle. And to the left, you can see the annotated membranes as well as a side view. This one appears to me to be an endothelial adherence junction based on the literature, but we'll need to use correlative EM techniques to verify that. We were also surprised to find these thin intersecting membrane protrusions between cells because they appear much less rigid than expected for philopodia that would, for example, be initiating cell-cell contact. So we're interested in further exploring their function at cell-cell contact. We also observed a range of vesicle shapes and sizes at the cell-cell contacts, both within and outside of the plasma membrane. So here you can see uh, multivesicular bodies. So to summarize, uh, we demonstrated a robust, versatile, maskless photopatterning technology for depositing ECM proteins on EM grids with programmed shape and position. These, this EM grid micropatterning technology can increase the success rate of cryo-ET data acquisition. Lattice micropatterning enabled our observation of an array of structures at endothelial cell cell contacts, demonstrating its utility in enhancing the rate of data acquisition for cellular cryo-ET studies. In the future, we want to focus on uh, using this technique for high-resolution mechanobiology studies. And with that, I want to thank the members of the Pruitt, Dunn, Weiss, Volkman, and Hanin labs who contributed to these studies, as well as the team at Alveoli. And now on to McTain, who will walk you through the use and benefits of micropatterning for cryofocus ion beam milling and cryo -IT. Hello, I'm Matthijn Vos. I'm the head of the Nano Imaging Core facility at Institut Pasteur in Paris, and we're specialized in cryo EF. Now, what Leah also beautifully showed is that if you want to do tomography on cells that have been grown on grids, you want to have the thinner areas of the cell that are accessible to the uh, electron beam. Uh, you want to have those areas in the center of the grid square because the grid bars indicated here with the black arrows while you're tilting are coming towards your area of interest and might block it. So you want to have the thinnest parts of the cell situated in the middle of the grid. And uh, when the parts are really very thin, as you can see in this, this uh, other example from Institut Pasteur, you can resolve many structures. For instance, here you can see actin fibers very nicely resolved. But what if you want to look at the thicker areas of the cell, in the center of the cell? Then we need a technology called cryofib. Now, cryofib uses a focused ion beam to mill away the top and the bottom of the cell, leaving a lamella or a window in the cell on which we can do cryotomography. And as you can see here, this technology was pioneered at the Max Planck Institute in Martensried. And this is a, an old but still very beautiful example of all the different structures you can already see and appreciate in the single transmission image of such, uh, such a window. And although still in its infancy, uh, the potential power of this technology is very evident as we, uh, if we take a closer look at, the, at, for instance, the Golgi in this case. So um, cell biologists are used to looking at plastic sections of uh, cells that are stained, dehydrated and fixed. And basically this process removes all the high resolution information uh, that you can obtain from the cell. So here you can see the two examples of on the left side, the 
plastic embedded sample, a section of a plastic embedded sample, and on the right side, uh, a slice from a tomogram from the reconstruction of this uh, same uh, structure of the Golgi um, in a cryofib lamella. And if we, we blow this up, you can very clearly see that there are structures present in the in the Golgi that cannot be found in a plastic embedded section, but uh, are visible in these uh, cryo EM lamella. Now at Institute Pasteur we have a Thermo Fisher Aquilos 2 and this is a small dual beam so it has a dual beam as the word already says. There is a electron column on the top and there is an ion column from the side. So this process starts with first uh, applying a protective uh, platinum coating to the grid that will protect the sample from the ion beam that will mill away material from the cell from the top and the bottom. So with the electron beam we can live view what we're doing and with the ion beam we mill away material from the cell. Now as you can see in this uh, promotion video from Thermo Fisher they already assume that the cell is in the middle of the grid square because it, it's much easier to mill away the material. If the cell is situated on the grid bars that are extremely thick it's almost impossible to mill away all this material with the ion beam. So as you can see here now, there's two windows being placed, one on the top and one on the bottom. And then from the side, the ion beam will mill away material from the top and from the bottom, leaving a freestanding lamella of about 100 to 200 nanometers in the center of the cell. This uh, lamella or this grid is then transferred into the TEM where we will do the uh, tomography. Now there's a possibility to apply a conductive uh, carbon coating to reduce the charging uh, when, the, uh, when the tomograms are being recorded. So then uh, when the sample is transferred to the TEM, in this case, because we use the Thermo Fisher workflow, it's uh, auto grids that we're using. These auto grids fit in the small dual beam and they also fit in the auto loader of uh, the Titan Cryos uh, that we have installed at Pasteur. Then we tilt the sample, we take pictures from every angle, and then we reconstruct the tomogram. Now this technology is still a, a rather manual operation. You will have to look for good areas of interest and you'll spend uh, a, a number of hours making, making a lamella. And if the lamella looks good, it looks like this, but in many cases uh, the lamellas have problems, they have cracks. The, the ice is not vitreous, there's contamination on the surface. And when you go to the TEM and you find out uh, what lamellas you have made, it might look like this, that most of the lamellas are too thick or some lamellas are even completely gone because you lost them during transfer. And this is with normal cells, but if you add on top of that that you also want to study bacteria or viruses, then some of the cells have not been infected or uh, your object of interest is not present in the lamella. And we need a lot of the object of interest because it's still cryo-EM, so we require to do a lot of image processing, which requires to have a lot of data. So uh, inherent to the technology, we need a lot of data, therefore we need a lot of lamellas, and at this moment the success rate is uh, rather low. Now the focused ion beam technology comes from the semiconductor industry and is actually quite mature. Only the adaptation that we are using is still in, uh, in the early stages. Now um, there is a lot of automation available. As you can see the picture here is the large dual beam. The tool that we are using is a small dual beam. But this technology is already around for a large number of years where these uh, large machine fully automatically mill away lamellas from silicon wafers that are then uh, analyzed in the TEM to look for, uh, for defects and, uh, and problems with the, with the computer chips. So um, the question is now, can we utilize all this automation to the application that we are using for uh, cryofib on cells? Now, if we look at a sample that we have, the only similarity with the silicon wafer is that the sample is round. If you look in more detail on uh, EM grids with cells grown on top of it, you will see that in many cases the cells are everywhere. And this is basically impossible to automate. So the question is now, can we find a way to 
automate this process so that we can use the already existing technology from the semiconductor industry and increase our yield and improve our success rate. So where we are today at Institute Pasteur, so with the Aquilus 1, we were able to manually, uh, if you can see here, uh, prepare maybe one, two or three lamellas per day and then do a couple of tomograms on those. Uh, we have upgraded the system now to the Aquilus 2. And the Aquilus 2 is capable of, uh, as we can see here, when you take an overview of the grid, you manually select the areas that you want to image or where you want to have a lamella being created. And then the system will go towards these areas and you have to set up each of those areas, which is happening now, in the correct orientation. So mainly setting up eucentric height. And when all these areas are pre-set up, then during the night, the automation starts and the system will start the automatic milling, as you can see here. And what you could also see in some of these cases, the lamella just explodes. So not all these lamellas will be good. But if you can set up during the day maybe 20 uh, places where you can mill a lamella and then during the night the lamellas are milled, maybe the next morning you have a larger number of lamella available to you than uh, what we currently have with the automation. But this is not yet the end stage where we want to go. This uh, workflow still requires an operator to manually set up each of the areas in, in kind of a batch process and then run this process overnight. So the question is now, can we actually go to full automation, similar as we find in the semiconductor industry? So for this, we need to make the silicon wafer equivalent of cells that have been grown on EM grids. To create this uh, regular grid that can be automated, we're using the micro patterning technology from Alveo. And with this technology, we're able to uh, micro pattern a certain profile which can control the shape of the cell and the size of the cell and also the location where the cell is growing. And in this way we can make sure that the cell is growing in the optimum place for the cryofit milling in the center of the grid square, which is also the optimal place for the tilting later in the TEM. And if we then can also combine this with uh, correlative light and electron microscopy, so with fluorescent microscopy, we might also be able to put a map over uh, our cells and tell the cryofib where to exactly mill so that our object of interest is in the right location. And Leia will now show uh, some results and how we do this and implement this technology at Institut Pasteur. Thank you, Martijn. Now into user experience. I'm Lea Swistak, PhD candidate in the US Inga team at the Institut Pasteur. I'm developing cryoclam pipelines, combining cell micropatterning on EM grids using the Primo system from Alveol, cryofluorescence microscopy, cryofipsem, and cryoTEM. I use this pipeline to study host pathogen interactions at the ultrastructural level. Primo contactless photo micropatterning device is really adaptable. I use it to pattern very fragile EM grids for cryofipsem applications. For these applications, cells are required to be in the center of the EM grid, but also in the center of the EM grid squares away from the grid bars. Steps to get patterned EM grids are easy to implement. First, you need to passivate the full surface of the EM grid. For this, you incubate the EM grid with polylysin and then with PEG-SVA. This creates a cell repulsive layer. Then, the alveol photo initiator is added onto the grids and we can move to the microscope equipped with the Primo system. The Primo system generates a DMD UV laser and shine light on the TEM grid. When it reacts with the photo initiator at specific areas, the PLL PEG-SVA is degraded. This allows to imprint patterns in the center of each grid squares. Talking about patterns, what we like a lot with the Primo system is that any pattern can be drawn in Inkscape, an open access software, and imported in the Primo associated software called Leonardo. This allows for endless biological applications. 
After printing your pattern onto the EM grid, you functionalize the updated region using extracellular matrix proteins. You can use collagen, fibronectin, fibrinogen, and more. Then you can proceed to cell seeding. Cells falling into the functionalized region will adhere and spread. Cells falling into the passivated areas of the grid will not be able to spread and will be removed by washes. At the end, cells spread and adopt the pattern shape. You can then treat these cells with drugs or infect them with pathogens. Because EM grids are sometimes difficult to access to and quite expensive, we take advantage that Primo system can be used on different substrates like glass to optimize our steps from micropatterning, cell seeding and cell treatment on glass slides. Once proper conditions are found, we integrate them into the full pipeline. Here you have an example from our coming papers describing all the protocols and steps needed to achieve cell micropatterning on EM grids and integrated into a cryoclam pipeline. In panel A, you can see the patterns printed onto a EM grid revealed by fluorescent fibrinogen. In panel C and D, you have an example of a cryofluorescence microscopy image. In panel C, you can see transmitted light and panel D, staining of the cells with WGA. The panel E shows an EM grid with patterned cells. The cells are properly placed in the center of the EM grid squares. Finally, you can see in panel F, a lamella milled into a patterned cell. And in G, the tomogram we can get from this patterned cell. Finally, I would like to show you some examples of applications we have here at Institut Pasteur that use micropattern cells on EM grids. In a collaboration with the Schwartz Lab, I used GFP split U2OS ACE2 cells to properly locate SARS CoV 2 infected cells. This allows to selectively mill lamella in only infected cells. With this, we were able to resolve ultrastructures of membrane rearrangement during SARS-CoV-2 infection. We applied the same pipeline, this time in a collaboration with the Felix Rey team, still at Institut Pasteur, to resolve chikungunya virus in a close to native state. Here you can see on this tomogram that the virus seems to cluster around some membrane areas. Here you have a segmented view of this same tomogram. With Felix Ray, we also worked on yellow fever. By using micropatterning in combination with cryoclam, we hope to build a fully automated pipeline, thus increasing our yield and throughput, and with this, our success rate of finding the object of interest inside the cells. Thank you very much, uh, Lia, Matang, and Lea. For those presentations. To conclude this tech talk, I would like to give you some numbers. To date, we have 74 uh, Primo systems sold and mostly installed in laboratories in Europe and the US. More than 40 papers using Primo for micropatterning, 3D cell culture, or prototyping of microfabrication has been published. Before we move to the QA session, a brief recap. On Primo and its application. Again, Primo is an optical apparatus plugged at the back of an inverted microscope. It allows for on demand quantitative UV light projection with a micrometric resolution, and any kind of biomolecules can be printed, such as fibronectin, vitronectin, laminin, collagen, matrigel, but also antibodies or streptavidin. Our light based approach is compatible with glass, plastic, PDMS, polypolymide gels, hydrogels, or electron microscopy grids. A large variety of experiments can be performed from purified molecules, single cells, pluricellular arrangements, co-culture, or tissue micropatterning. Finally, microfabricating environments can be generated and hydrogels can be shaped for standardized 3D cell culture experiments. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions.
Well, thank you so much, Pierre-Olivier, Lia, Matain, and Lea for this very nice presentation. Um, it seems that there are no questions in the chat right now, but uh, people, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask it. Um, in the meantime, maybe um, Lia, Matain, and Lea, you could sum up uh, to conclude the advantage you see in the Primo system for your own application? Um, yeah, actually just looking at the, looking at everybody's talks together, um, I realized that we didn't talk that much about the different chemistries that one can use for grids. So like just yesterday, um, I was prepping some grids in the lab and for the first time I was using gold grids. So if no one else has a question quite yet, I did wanna ask you guys, um, you know, the chemistries that I'm aware of are what I put into the first paper with the polyolysine graft polyethylene glycol and then the liquid photo initiator. And we and others have since moved to the separate um, steps of the, of the functionalization that start with the polyolysine and then go on to use the PEG SVA for a little bit of a more stable passivation followed by uh, the more uh, dense um, gel photo initiator. But I was using gold grids for the first time. And of course I'm tempted to use some sort of thiol chemistry, um, but I was wondering if uh, you guys have had success on gold grids because until now I've been using carbon. So yeah. Uh, Peo, do you want to take that? Uh, I was thinking that maybe Lea would be more, a better, yeah, in uh, Pasteur, we use the gold grids, but we are covered with the carbon 24. So we have the success with this, but not uh, full gold. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and so there are some to... developments, sorry, uh, going on um, internally. So um, we are developing different protocols um, and we're going to share it very soon. Sorry, Pierre-Olivier, I interrupted you. No, I just wanted to add that I don't have a lot of expertise on EM grids, for sure. I'm mostly working on, I would say, glass and plastic and also on a PDMS, like this elastomeric uh, foil. And so I used to work a lot with uh, PLL JPEG at first, and then I moved to PLL plus PEG SVA. And now I'm using uh, the jellyfied form of uh, PLPP, the photo initiator that we call PLPP gel because it's way faster. I would say it's a little bit less uh, easy to handle, but you save a lot of time uh, on the UV exposure, um, the UV illumination steps. So yeah, that's something I think is very uh, important to move to, yeah. To go faster, to move to the PLPP gel, I think is a very good option. Matain and Leah, are you using the PLPP liquid or the gel? Uh, the gel. The yeah, we tested both at Alveol Lab directly, and uh, then at the end, we choose to, to move to the gel because it's faster. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you should switch to it. I know. I I actually have, although in our preprint, I didn't I didn't put any results with the gel and the PEG SVA um, because I just felt like I hadn't characterized it well enough. So I just put, um, you know, the, the other method with the liquid, but I, I actually have been using it for, for a little while. It is much quicker. I was able to micro pattern 17 grids yesterday and I did everything in one day. The, the passive, it was a long day, <laughs> the passivation <laughs> and the patterning. Um, but this is just amazing relative to what I used to be able to do. Um, yeah. So maybe, yeah, maybe just to, to clarify, it's maybe not clear for the for the audience. So we propose two solutions, uh, a liquid form of the photo initiator and this uh, jellified uh, concentrated form that we name uh, PLPP gel. And so, yeah, the, the role of this photo initiator is uh, upon UV light illumination uh, is to degrade this uh, anti-fooling layer that is deposited on the, on the surface. And the good thing, I think, is that this approach is exactly the same on EM grids than on plastic or on glass slides. So 
I would say the surface uh, chemistry, of course, you need to learn it, but once you know how to do it, uh, it will be the same protocol on any kind of substrates. So that's, that's something I think very important to, uh, to take into account. And we have a question. Um, so it's from Alex and uh, Rigort. And the question is, what ECM proteins can you recommend for the surface coating? Are there some which are better suited? So I guess it depends on your cell type, but you must all have different experience you can share. So all your answers will be very interesting. Well, maybe I can start and then uh, you can guys give uh, your own um, matrix that you use. So I've been working, I would say, with most of the, of the cell adhesion molecules uh, that we use in labs. So of course, fibronectin, um, collagen, matrigel. Uh, I also work a lot with uh, antibodies that can also be printed on uh, surfaces. Uh, we use treptavidin when we want to attach biotinylated proteins. So I would say that any biomolecules can be attached on the on surfaces. I know, Leah, that you are working mostly with uh, gelatin, I guess. Uh, the previous paper, we used gelatin. I think if anybody's starting out with this technique, definitely use an ECM with a fluorescent tag, just so that, I mean, of course, for, for Matine and Leah with correlative techniques, you need some fluorescence, um, which will either come from your cells or the ECM. But it, it's just good to make sure that all of the parameters that you're using are suitable for your substrate and, and all of that. So um, cytoskeleton um, makes an excellent uh, rhodamine laminin and an excellent rhodamine fibronectin. And then I wish I could recall where we get our Oregon Green 488 gelatin. I've been really happy with that product. And then, you know, sometimes the fluorescently tagged proteins are a bit expensive. So what you can do, for example, with fibronectin is, is buy a nice big stock of um, regular fibronectin and then just spike it with, for example, 10% of, of the fluorescently tagged stuff and it should last for a really long time. So yeah, I, I'm now actually working with Matrigel, but I don't have results yet. Okay, and Evan, I would say if you don't have access to these uh, fluorescently tagged uh, cellagen molecules, what I do on a daily basis is to mix, for instance, fibronectin with a little bit of purified GFP or a little bit of uh, purified uh, Alexa 488 streptavidin, whatever you have in hand, actually. Uh, of course, if you want to do something very clean, I would recommend to buy these uh, labeled fluorescent um, cellagen molecules. But if you want to, I would say, optimize your protocol, you can still mix your cellagen molecule with any kind of fluorescent biomolecule that will be co-adsorbed on the surface with your favorite biomolecules. And, well, we're waiting for other questions. Um, Matain, uh, could you tell us what in a few words, the benefits you keep in mind from using Primo for your own experience? Uh, yeah, yeah. For me, it's um, because uh, the, the success rate is, is rather low of, of what we have been doing at Pasteur. So you work an entire day. You, you can only put two grids in the cryofib at once. And if those grids are not good, uh, you're searching for cells in good areas. And then on top of that, you also need to search if you find a cell in a good area that, that it is in our case infected, um, then the success rate is, is rather low. You can, you can be working a full day on the machine and have, uh, has, have zero grids that you put in the microscope. So um, yeah, being able to print all the cells in the right location, then at least you know that you have about, uh, let's say 40, 20, 40 cells uh, that, are, that are at least complying to the yeah, to the location criteria. And then on top of that, you, they should require, uh, or they should comply to the infection criteria. But in principle, if you, if you use the printing technique, you are almost assured that, that one of the two grids that you're putting in the cryofib will, will give you results. Well, in, in the end, give you a couple of lamella where you can, uh, can run a tomogram on. And uh, yeah, of course, the idea is to, to fully automate it and to really go brute force. Uh, 
in, in the microscope you can do about one tomogram an hour, depending a little bit on the settings you do. Some people do, do two, to, two tomograms an hour, but let's keep one tomogram an hour. So on average, you can do 20 tomograms a day in a batch process. So if we can produce 20 lamellas a day and 20 tomograms uh, a day for the TEM, then everything is about in the same order of magnitude. So you can then nicely put a, uh, put a flow on it where you create your, your uh, patterns, you grow your cells, you do your fit milling, you do your tomography, you do your reconstruction. And this is all done in a week and then you just repeat it, uh, thereby increasing the chance that you, um, that you find your bacteria or your virus, what you're looking for. So, it, so in principle, it, it, it basically gives you uh, al almost 100% chance that the grid that go in the cryofib will also go into the microscope with a couple of, uh, of good lamella that you can use. Thank you, Martijn. And uh, you've been working closely with Lea. Uh, so Lea, you've also seen an improvement for your experiments. Maybe yes. you want to uh, say if you want. Yes, yes. And also what uh, we like a lot is like, because we are in a platform setting, what is good is that any pattern can be uh, put into, like any shape can be a pattern onto the, the grid. So it's applicable to a lot of projects, not only mine, may, but also other people project in our situ Pasteur. So I think uh, what we retain, like what we really like also about the system is like the flexibility of it. Thank you. Um, I don't know if we have time left. Um, I don't know. Um, is there something else you would like to, to add? We still don't have questions. I don't know if you saw something on your bells on, on CellBio. Apparently there are private messages too. No, but may, maybe I can say just a few words about uh, another application that we didn't okay. really detail today which is the structuration of uh, 3D environments. So, of course, growing cells on electron microscopic grids is very important to get these uh, details about the internal organization. But growing cells into, I would say, more physiological environments, like 3D environments, is also something very important. And with the same uh, microscope and the same chemo system that you can use for uh, micro patterning of biomolecules, you can also, as I showed, uh, structure UV sensitive hydrogels if you want to grow your cells into a topographically controlled environment. And uh, because the Primo system is also able to uh, shine UV light in a quant quantitative manner, you can also think of tuning the, the stiffness of the rheological properties of the materials that you are working with. So I would say that with Primo, you really get a, a complete control over the the conditions uh, onto which you grow your cells. So that's really something I think interesting to keep in mind. Not only you can uh, micro pattern biomolecules, but you can also shape uh, environments in 3D uh, for, I would say, more uh, biomimetic uh, conditions. Thank you, Gary. Um... Well, um, I think we're all set. Thank you again for this great presentation and for taking the time to share your experience and project of experiments. Uh, it was very kind of you. Um, if uh, you still have some questions uh, for the viewers, don't hesitate to contact uh, the speakers directly um, and then and there will be a replay of this presentation available on the CellBio website for a month. So that's all. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.